welcoming back State Representative Charlie Kimball for yet another week. Uh, recording this on Friday, January 26th. Uh, we're four weeks into the uh, new legislative session at this point, and welcome back, uh, Representative Kimball. How are you? Thank you, Patrick. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be back. It's our uh, second week of being in person in the State House in a hybrid environment. So it's uh, it's uh, next week we go back even more. So it's gradually getting back to normal, I think. Still just the House, though, right? Is The Senate is still meeting remotely through the end of what? February? Or? February, I think. Yeah, that's correct. So it's uh, the House is still is coming back now. And we still have a number of members that are not able to attend because they either have COVID or a close contact with somebody who has had COVID. But otherwise, people are meeting in person. It's, it, you learn so much just by being around other people um, for the side conversations. And it's very beneficial. So we've, we're seeing some benefit of that already. It's it's really good. But. Mm -hmm. That's good. So and you made it back. Yeah. Looks like you're back in Woodstock. I am back in the big city. So we got yeah. done a little early today uh, on Fridays. So the, usually we get out about two or three o'clock. And so today we actually did get out at three o'clock. So good to be back. Um, mm -hmm. How about this week? What are the hot issues? Pretty big week in the House. Uh, we actually passed a bill. It's numbered S30, which means it originated in the Senate, and it's a bill that came over as uh, pro prohibiting firearms inside of hospitals. Uh, and so that bill came into our uh, Judiciary Committee and a few things got added to it. Uh, the first provision though was to make it illegal to knowingly bring a firearm into a hospital. And knowingly is important because some people might be injured on the road or something that might uh, carry a firearm and then they're brought into the hospital, they can't be found to be breaking the law. Um, so anyway, that's one piece. To add it to that is a couple of provisions. One extends the time for a licensed firearm dealer to complete a background check from three days to 30 days. Because most of the time, 97% of the time, a background check gets done instantaneously or within two or three days. But there are some, if you don't get that background check, then the default is you provide that, uh, you complete the sale. And so there've been a couple of cases where the person has gotten the sale and then the background check comes back afterwards and uh, the person should not have received a firearm because they're uh, because of their criminal history in the past. The other is it, it affirms a judge's ability when issuing an emergency relief from abuse order uh, to seize a defendant's firearms. Um, and the last piece of that bill is it gives a healthcare professional permission to alert uh, uh, law enforcement officer that a person may be a danger to themselves or others. Um, so that currently you can't do. So if somebody is exhibiting those signs, they're gonna hurt themselves and they say, it's okay if you tell a, a police officer. So that's a licensed medical professional. So it's a doctor, it's a nurse, anybody that's licensed in our, in our statutes. Uh, so from here, the bill goes back to the Senate, see if they agree with it. And it's likely to be controversial. This does not in any way take away from someone's rights to uh, own or bear a firearm, uh, but it does provide extra protections uh, so that you reduce the amount of, amount of harm that could occur from one of those emergency relief protection orders as well. So that's, that was big. That's a, really our first controversial bill aside from uh, one was the licensing. Uh, what was the vote on that one? Oh, the vote was 97 to 49, I believe, hmm. in the House. Um, and then it moves on to the Senate. Um, and I think it'll, it'll go through the Senate as well. The, the, um, and then the other one is the re licensing of residential contractors. Uh, residential contractors are not currently licensed through the Secretary of State's office. And most of the complaints, I wouldn't say most of the complaints, but the Attorney General's office gets a lot of complaints from consumers about contracts that are not performed as agreed to by the contractor and the homeowner. Um, and this is a light touch on it, um, which means that the, the contractor just has to register. Uh, and then when they, ha when they have a job that's more than 3,500 bucks, then it requires a contractor to enter into a contract with an agreement uh, with a homeowner. Um, and that, that's basically the, the regulation. There are some that are afraid that this means that, uh, you know, the guy down the street that's just doing work <clears throat> um, has to go out and get a contract and makes it all formal-like. Uh, and what does that do? And 
Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, and there are enough homeowners that have been, uh, you know, victims of some unscrupulous contractors, but it also protects the contractor saying, you know what, here's the deal. I'm going to provide you with this service. You're going to owe me this money when I complete it. So it's, it's trying to get to that level. So that's a, a second. And where did that bill originate? That one's been kicking around a while. Um, mm. That one had originated in the house before in a previous attempt that did not make it across. Um, so I think what happened is this bill originated in the house, went over to the Senate. They came, kicked, uh, revised it, brought it back to us. We made one revision and brought it back to them and they approved it. Uh, and now it's on its way to the governor's desk for signature. Interesting. It, and, you know, most contractors uh, are uh, professionals, and uh, I've always worked on a handshake with most of the contractors that we work with um, just for home improvements, and it's always worked out well. But there are cases where it's really gone south, so it's it's really meant to protect both the contractor and the homeowner. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had one other question about, oh, the omnibus bill. So where does that go now? I know that um, it's out there, and you said it was going to be uh, the, the rural – Economic Development Working Group that you are the co-chair of. Um, your, your, your big piece of work was this Rural uh, Economic Development Omnibus Bill, and that is out there in various forms, or is it still in its original state um, going through committees? It's both. Um, mm -hmm. So it's both in its original form, and it's sitting in the House Natural Resources and uh, uh, wildlife, uh, Fish and Wildlife Committee, and the, I'm not sure if they're going to take it up. They're really working on governance for Act 250 right now, uh, but it, we also broke it into pieces, into separate pieces, and those are getting some traction. So there's one for a, a forestry planning. Uh, there's one for accessory on farm businesses. There's another one for recreational trails. There's one for uh, municipal heat um, so to I, I'm think I'm not using the right term, but it's to allow me to, to create a program to help municipalities convert their system from what they have to mm -hmm. something that's more efficient. Um, so those bills live separately, um, and they're being taken up by respective committees. So that's cool. On the Act 250 piece, uh, we just met with uh, Senator Chris Bray, who heads up the Senate Natural Resources Committee, because the Senate is working on some policy issues. And so on Thursday, we met with him to find out what's in the bill that he's pushing and are there pieces that we've suggested for Act 250 reform that could make it into that. And it looks like there's a possibility there. Uh, and then if whatever gets passed out of the House, then comes over to the Senate, and we hope there's an opportunity there. So it's, I, I think it looks pretty good, but, uh, you know, four weeks in, we're already thinking that the session is almost, you know, really long in the tooth. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're starting to look at what's possible now. It it's really gets challenging. Yeah, it is. Every it, 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 Imagine everything is so fast tracked. I mean, it seems like the trajectory is usually like the de facto midterm date is usually right around town meeting. Right. So and that's quickly approaching. So here you are. What seems to me like you're early into the session. But yeah, you're, I guess, maybe a quarter of the way in already. Just yeah. So, so it's I'll fast and furious, a, I'm sure. An example is we're, uh, my committee in, uh, in the House on Economic Development is looking at workforce development and the workforce mm -hmm. shortages. So we are taking so much testimony from people that are providing career development services. We met with UVM today as to what they're doing with internships. We met with a state economist. Uh, we're meeting with all these different people. Next week, we meet with all these people that are in the uh, elder sector, you know, who's going back to work with mature workers. And we're taking all this testimony, but it has to be out of the house uh, by March 11th. I was like, ooh, okay. So at some point, we have to stop taking testimony, write the bill, take testimony again, and then uh, have it go out. So it's it's time pressure, yeah. Um, and you meet with your the rural economic working or development working group uh, one, once a week, and then you have, and then, but there's other activity that happens throughout the week at that committee, and then on top of that you have your economic development committee, and what, I mean, so what, your day's pretty full. I mean, Tuesday through Friday, jam packed. It's pretty full. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that typically uh, it starts about seven thirty, and then it ends about five thirty six o'clock. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it makes for a long day, but. Um, then there's just stuff back to back all day in those hours? Back to back all day, mm-hmm. back to back. So, yeah, and I, it's exciting today, for instance, I met with the eighth graders at Woodstock Union Middle School and talked to them about what we're working on. They had questions about uh, different things in the legislature. So it was great, uh, met with them over Zoom. Oh, okay. I was going to ask because they're not you're not doing field trips at the state house right yet, right? Oh. It's not not, not open. Well, to- you, you know it is open, um, but so people are For coming, groups? and it's yeah. uh, it's great to see people coming through. Not huge groups like usual. Mm-hmm. I mean, we yeah. it's been enormous in the past, but there are some groups coming through, and there are some people walking in the building. It's um, it's good. They got to wear a mask. And, but, yeah. And what about lobbyists? Are they there? Uh, very few of them. Uh, very so few some lobbyists kind of limits are that are put on other folks coming in? There's a limit to room capacity, but there's no limit as to people coming in the building. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, but I think the lobbyists find that it's easier to keep track of what's going on in the building by watching all the committees on Zoom. Yeah, well, and they're all available on YouTube because those go uh, go out automatically on YouTube. And then we get a lot of them because they get processed and some post-production done by Orca Media in Montpelier and then shared with stations like ours. So we air a lot of the committees and uh, that get covered, and we really focus on the local legislators, so yourself and uh, some of the other districts that we cover, because um, we can't possibly air them all. But there's, it's a tremendous because of the technology and because of the work that Orca Media does. It's it's amazing uh, how much how accessible uh, the state government is right now. Um, yeah, I, you know, if you want I to tune in, you can. The opportunities are there. I think it's great. I really do for people to be able to see what their legislators are doing, even though it may be boring at times, but, uh, no. you know, it creates, yeah, oh yeah. Uh, but it creates oh, such access, uh, and to really know what's going on. Uh, I don't think we're going to put that toothpaste back in the tube. Um, mm-hmm. so that's going to be permanent going forward. And, uh, I, I think that's wonderful. That transparency is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is all part of it. So I, I want to wel- uh, yeah, we welcome you into the studio every Friday, and thanks for doing this and, and keeping us updated. I do. Before we leave, I have this new thing I'm going to try with you. Is uh, I've, I'm soliciting questions from your constituents actually, and I just started this week, and I have one in so far, and hopefully we get more as we move along. Uh, but I have one from uh, 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 a resident of Reading who wanted to know about um, where we were with uh, cannabis uh, recreational cannabis regulation. So. Um, she asked that, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, geez. Uh, she says she's not too updated on what is going on with the state with the new laws regarding cannabis sales. So can you tell me what the current status is uh, on legislative action working to help guide that? So she wants to know, like, where are we with cannabis? Sure. And that's fair. So there's, there's a few things. Um, the Cannabis Control Board was charged with coming up with a whole bunch of regulations as to how to actually manage the regulation of the market. And they've made a lot of progress around that. Uh, they did ask the legislature to come up with what the fee structure would be for any any of the licensees. Um, so there's five different types of licenses that you could get. And the initial licenses would be given to those who are growers and small cultivators. Um, so the regulatory market, the regulated market, I don't think is scheduled to open until October of 2022. Uh, but the cultivator licenses, I think is as early as May of 2022. So that's coming up pretty fast. I know that the, the house ways and means committee, uh, which was charged with establishing what that fee structure would be just voted out a bill as to what the fees would be. So that has to go through the house and then it'd be approved by the Senate and signed by the governor. Um, and in order to establish those. So then the Cannabis Control Board can start taking applications and then uh, uh, granting those licenses. So uh, that's w- at least one of the provisions. Um, so it's coming along and it's, uh, it's, it's a busy session, but that's important to get through because we really want to have that regulated market in place by October. Uh, and we'll certainly pass that along. And if you have a question for Representative Kimball, um, you can, uh, I guess, email it to me. So it's uh, uh, P. Cody, P. C. O. D. Y. at Okemo Valley TV, um, or Okemo Valley dot TV, rather. It'll be up on the screen. Uh, uh, <laughs> certainly, you can um, send it to me that way. And we'll also have a, um, um, a link on our website uh, for sending in uh, comments and questions. So, um, Representative Kimball, we want to thank you again and uh, give you an opportunity to. Uh, to to head us out on any parting thoughts that you have. 
Well, it was pretty cold this week. I sure think it was. was about 17 below up in Montpelier. What was it down in Okemo Valley? What, how cold were you? I think we might have saw uh, the night before last when I was leaving work. I think it was uh, 12 below. But Ooh, that's cold. So, yeah. So yeah. I, I'm <laughs> hopeful that it's going to be getting warmer. Yeah. 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 You and me both. Okay. Um, right. Well, we'll see you again and uh, appreciate it. Thanks. Looking forward to it.